I want to talk to you from the subject, you need a fireplace. You need a fireplace. Look at your sister next to you and tell her, you need a fireplace. In the past few years, home improvements and home renovations have become so popular. They have become so popular that, matter of fact, I think it's because of the television networks that are so popular that we see how many people want to renovate their homes or, or you want to do something new. You want to add on a room or maybe you just want a new house. Actually, you have dreams that you didn't even know that you wanted because you've watched HGTV, because you've watched Do It Yourself Network, because you've watched Fine Living. Uh, now you want heated floors. You didn't even know that existed. But after watching these shows, you got desires that you didn't even know existed. Uh, now you want a heated towel rack right by your shower in your master, your, your master bathroom. But, but it's because you've been exposed to all of these things that now you have a new wish list. But of all of the wish list that we see, we find that fireplaces are still a mainstay of what people want on their wish list. A, a fireplace is something that so many people think they need for their home. Somebody say, you need a fireplace. It's been reported that a value of a home is increased by $2,500 if there is a fireplace in the home. You need a fireplace. Many people think that it is a must-have, but the reasons that people want the fireplace differ from person to person. Some people want a fireplace for the look. They don't even care if the fireplace works. <laughs> they just like the stone around it. They like the granite beneath it, and they like the mantle above it. Some people just like the look of a fireplace. And then there are some that like the light of a fireplace. They like the way the crackling fire makes their skin glow in the dimly lit room. Because when the room is lit only by a fireplace, there are some flaws that disappear when you are in the light of a fireplace. It makes a bumpy face look smooth when you're in the light of a fireplace. It can make your crooked teeth look straight when you are in the light of a fireplace. It can make your curves look like they are in place. Cellulite disappears in the light of a fireplace. So we like fireplaces for many different reasons. Some like the look of the fireplace, some like the light of the fireplace, but some of us need the life of the fire the life of the fireplace. They, we actually need it to function. We, we are not that person that just wants it for the look, that, that person that doesn't want to clean it out, doesn't want to chop any wood, doesn't want to have to clean up any soot. But some of us actually need the warmth from the fire. Some of us need a fireplace because we know that it's reported that heating bills are cut to a fraction of the cost if you have a functioning fireplace in that room. A, a fire is is a ball, a combination of energy that gives off heat. And a functioning fireplace is something that doesn't just look good. It doesn't just light the room, but there's a life of the fire that actually gives off warmth. And I don't know about you, but I need the heat. Somebody say, I need the heat. Matter of fact, I wake up every morning thanking God for heat. Now, I know those of you who live in flaming temperatures such as Dallas might find yourselves often complaining about the heat. You may say, it's too hot. What is the temperature on? Hades? <laughs> there may be some of you that find yourself complaining about the heat, but we need the heat. Somebody say, we need the heat. Now, I admire those of you who God has gifted to wear your hair naturally with the texture that you were born with. But I must say that God has not gifted me in this season of my life to wear my hair naturally. So every 
every step that I get up in the morning, I need the heat. Matter of fact, if I were to wash my hair and to let it dry naturally, I'd be about seven inches taller. But I'm just going to be pleased at my five, three and a half self. And I am going to admit to you all that I need the heat. Uh, when you wake up in the morning and you begin to bathe, you will find that there are some germs, some odors, and some things on your body that cold water will not get off. You need the heat. It's actually scientifically proven that you need the temperature of the water to be between 98 degrees and 102 degrees for there to be personal hygiene that takes place. You need the heat. When you were hungry this morning, perhaps you wanted a hot breakfast. You didn't want an egg straight from the refrigerator. You didn't want bacon straight from the freezer. You didn't want anything, uh, like some toast that was cold, but you needed the heat. Every step that you went through this morning, you may find that you needed the heat. When you went to get dressed in that cute outfit that you had on, when you first got it out of the suitcase, perhaps it had some wrinkles and folds and bends that the designer did not design in that fabric, but you didn't need a cold iron. You didn't need a warm iron, but you needed a hot iron. Somebody say, I need the heat. And today in our text, join me and Daniel, we find three Hebrew boys who welcomed heat into their lives. We find three Hebrew boys who knew that they needed the heat and God knew that they needed a fireplace. It's Daniel, the third chapter. We see three young men. Their original names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In the old African-American church, someone might say Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro. <laughs> and if you have little children like me, you might know them as the names on Veggie Tales, which is Rack, Shack, and Benny. <laughs> but however, there were three Hebrew boys. In chapter 3, we see that the king had made a golden image. Verse 2, then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. On your Lunch and Learn handouts, point number one, Nebuchadnezzar made a decree that was important. He made a decree that was important. He declared that everyone had to come bow down. It didn't matter who your daddy was or who your mama is. It didn't matter how important you thought you were. You had to come down to this plane called Dura and bow down to this image that he had set up. So if your name was Judge Judy, you still had to come there. You saw that it says the judges had to be there. Judge Hatchet had to be there. Judge Mathis had to be there. Judge Joe Brown had to be there. Didn't matter what your title was. You still had to come down and bow down to this golden image. Rick Perry had to be there. You did see that it said the governors had to be there. Everybody, no matter what your title was, had to come down to this place called Dura. And even we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were important people too because we see back in Daniel, the first chapter, the fourth verse, it tells us that they were young. They had no defect. They were good looking. They were intelligent. They were part of the king's court. They were important too. We see that they were multilingual. They were smart in every area. We see that they were important too, but they too were obedient to authority even though they were important. And some of us think that we're exempt from authority because we think we're important. Because we have a new title now. Because you think that somebody is serving you. You, you expect people to serve the missus instead of you serving the masses. There are some of us that just expect to break the rules because we are important. But we see here that even the important people had to come and follow this decree. Their importance did not exempt them from the rules. So Nebuchadnezzar made this decree, and he had set up this statue. 
And out of obedience, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego showed up. And it's okay that they showed up. That part was not disobedience. That part was not idolatry. Because there are some places that you have to show up in order to go up. There are some places that God has you as a setup, as a launching pad to what he's about to do next in your life. So he made this decree that was important, but number two, the three Hebrew boys made a decision that was imperative. We see in chapter three, verses five, that at the moment that you hear the sound of the horn, the fluke, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, all of this music, whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of a blazing fire. And then in verse 12, there were certain Jews who were appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men disregarded Nebuchadnezzar, and they did not bow down. Now, what I like about these three Hebrew boys is that they did not allow their geography to change their theology. I'm so excited to know three boys like this because some of us change based on who we're around. There are too many of us that are chameleon Christians. You just blend in with who's ever around. There are too many of us that are spiritually bipolar, but is there anybody here that's ready to stand up when everybody else is bowing down? I'm so excited that, see, they were exiles that had been brought over from Judah to Babylon. And in Judah, they had been raised in monotheism, the, the praise of one God. And now they were in this land where polytheism was running rampant, the worship of many gods. But they didn't let where they were change their faith from where they had been. They took the faith that they had from their past and utilized it in the place that there were. And some of us have changed how we act based on where we are. Some of you acted more saved when you were at your home church than now that you're the first lady. We just can't see that saved side of you so much. There's somebody in here that needs to decide today that you're not going to allow your geography to change your theology. Is there anybody willing to admit that you used to be nicer before you became the first lady? You used to be a sweeter person before you became the first lady. Is there anybody willing to take the mask off and admit that you've turned into somebody you don't even recognize now that you're at this church that you don't like, now that you're in this denomination that you didn't grow up in, now that you're in this city that he brought you to, that you don't even like the people in this city, they don't speak to nobody, that you, they just cold. Is there anybody that knows your personality has changed since your geography has changed? But somebody needs to today commit to consistency and know that your geography should not change your theology and these three Hebrew boys were the same person they had the same faith regardless of where they were if they were in Babylon they were standing for Christ for God if they were in Judah they were standing for God and there's somebody here who needs to decide you're gonna be the same person every day it takes too much energy to figure out which person you gonna be today have you ever had a friend that was different from day to day? They was nice on Monday, mean on Wednesday, neutral on Tuesday. Somebody in here needs to decide that God's called you to be one person. And we need you to be that one person every day. You need to realize that you've been called to be Christ-like and he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Is there anybody in here ready to commit to consistency? And so we look at these three Hebrew boys who had consistency. And it's so exciting because even what they used to be called in their former place, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they were called something different in this place, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. But they didn't let what the people called them change who they were on the inside. And some of us have gotten some new titles and you acting real extra. You acting real different now that you got this extra little title. You know you still Kiki from the block, but now they call you first.
first lady, so now you got a different attitude. You know that they still call you little mama when you go over your family house, but now they call you elect lady, reverend doctor, reverend mother, prophetess, bishop, and whatever they call you, you need to make sure that you're still being that person that God created you to be. No matter what the people around you are calling you, you need to make sure that you're answering to what God calls you and not to the label that people call you. And if you got a position that's putting your praise on pause, you need to shake off that position so that you can be the servant that God has called you to be. Is there anybody in here ready to be who God wants you to be and not what others expect you to be? So not only do we see Nebuchadnezzar make a decree that was important, we see the three Hebrew boys make a decision that was imperative, but then we see Nebuchadnezzar plan a demise that should be and would have been impeding. Look with me at verse number 11. It says, whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Now he made this rule. But that did not stop the three Hebrew boys from standing. And some of us fall in fear too quickly. They haven't seen the fire. They haven't smelt the fire. But some of us get fearful just at the thought of fire. But God sends some fiery situations in our lives on purpose. Because God has a purpose for a fireplace in our lives. But listen to this. I think that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were so excited about standing because they saw that this was a golden image. Now, when the Bible talks about gold, it uses the word gold. It tells us about heaven. The streets will be paved with gold. But this image was golden. So you mean to tell me that there are a group of people denying my God over something that was not even solid gold? It was merely a statue that was gold plated? And so you got three Hebrew boys standing up saying, I know y'all don't think that we're about to deny our God over something that's not even real and as you look at your life how many of you can admit that you've been bowing down to some stuff that isn't even real you've been lowering your standards to buy some stuff on credit to impress some people who don't like you what are you bowing down to that isn't even real real you've been cheating on your taxes claiming other people's kids in the church because you just need a little bit more money back what are you bowing down to that isn't even real you've been trying to please those three families in the church that are the biggest givers you don't like those people you've just been fake faulty fictitious with them because you need them to keep giving so that the lights can stay on at the church are they your source or is god your source what are you bowing down to that isn't even real somebody needs to decide that you're going to stand up in the face of the fake stuff because you know that it's not worth you denying a real god over some fake gold what have you been bowing down to that isn't even real and i'm here to encourage somebody that if god be for you he is more than the world against you he's more than the 1 million 232,940 people in dallas if god be for you he is more than the world against you he's more than the 23 million 507,783 people in texas if god be for you then who can be against you he's more than the six billion six 602 million 224 175 people in the world if God be for you he's more than the world against you so why are you tripping over them two people at your church that don't like you if God be for you who can be against you is there anybody in here 
you're ready to stand for God in the midst of any situation. If God be for you, who? Look at your neighbor and say, who? Who can be against you? Those people votes don't even count and God is the only super delegate. So why are you even tripping? Somebody needs to get excited that if God be for you, who can be against you? Not only do we see Nebuchadnezzar make a decree that was important, we see the three Hebrew boys make a decision that was imperative. We see Nebuchadnezzar plan a demise that would have been impeding. Then we see the king make a demand that was an impairing implosion. When the three Hebrew boys didn't bow down, Nebuchadnezzar was like, oh, they must not have heard me. We see in verse 14 and 15 that he gives them another chance. Guess what? We're going to play the music again. <laughs> I know y'all didn't mean to stand up. We're going to play the music again. And this time you're supposed to bow down, okay? All right. So verse 14 and 15 says, is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? You didn't serve my God or worship the golden image. Now, if you're ready this time, at the moment I play the music, this is when you're supposed to bow down. Do you know that the enemy is not going to stop at the one time of trying to get you to fall, trying to get you to slip, trying to get you to dip, trying to get you to fall, trying to get you to bow? You have to be consistent because the enemy is always persistent. You do remember our friend Joseph in the book of Genesis. He was able to shake off Potiphar's wife one time, but she just kept coming back and said day after day. She was like, lie with me. Then she said, just lie by me. And she had to have been cute because if she wasn't temptation, he wouldn't have to run. Temptation is not temptation unless you want it. And, and God knows, uh, he knows that, that you are, are in some situation that you just need to run from. You just need to say, feet don't fail me now. And so somebody needs to know that the enemy does not stop after one time trying to get you to bow down. But you have to decide today to be consistent because the enemy is going to be persistent. And some of you have been bowing down to assignments that aren't even yours. Some of you have been doing children's church, nursery, frying chicken, directing the choir, women's ministry, uh, counting the money, playing the piano, playing the organ, playing the drums, playing the tambourine. Washing the dishes, washing the handkerchief, uh, ironing the handkerchiefs. When you're doing any other assignment than your own, you're bowing down beneath your potential because God has an assignment specifically for you. And if you spend your time doing what somebody else is assigned to do, then you won't do the purpose that God has developed in you, that has deposited within you. There's a specific and authentic thing that God wants to use you to do. But if you're so busy running around like a chicken with his neck cut off, then when do you have time to even hear what your assignment is in that ministry? There's some of you that have been bowing down, doing whatever the people want you to do. And people at your church will experiment with you. They will see how many things can we get her to do. Well, you need to decide today that the experiment is over. The experiment is over. I want to hear what God wants me to do and not take your opinions about what you all think I should do. So, these three Hebrew boys stayed on task, and they kept standing. So, Nebuchadnezzar was so mad, it tells us that his facial expression dropped. Look at verse 19. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expression was altered toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. After all, these, this is his king's court. And so, he was so mad that he says... Turn the furnace up seven times 
hotter. And so he made this demand that became an impairing implosion because when he asked for it to be turned up seven times hotter, he also asked for his men to tie them up. They tied up their hands. They tied up their feet. But it was so exciting to watch what happened next. When they went in tied up, the fire was so hot that it burned the men that threw them in the fire. The same men that tied them up was destroyed in front of their eyes without them having to lift a finger. They couldn't lift a finger, their, their, their hands were tied up. And so there are some of you that are spending energy trying to get rid of your enemies, but God knows how to asphyxiate it so much so that your enemies will turn on each other. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed his own men. And so what he meant for them was an impairing implosion. It messed up his own camp. He killed off his own camp. So the people that are tying you down, the people that are trying to bind you, the devil will turn on on itself the enemies will turn on each other the haters will leave each other the haters will leave and if somebody leaves your church don't be sad be excited Wow God you've blessed me what energy you've saved me how blessed in the eloquent words of dr. Lois Evans last night put them out and so the devil put them out All you got to do is be obedient. The enemies will turn on each other in the face of your obedience. Now, you can't put your hands in it and be trying to, I'm just going to trip them a little bit before that. <laughs> Banana peel on the floor. No, you have to allow God to fix that thing because his, vengeance is his, says the Lord. And he can do it better than you can anyway. So all you got to do is walk in obedience and watch God blow your mind. So then we see a demonstration that was improving, number five. So exciting. Look at this. Verse 23. And then these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. Somebody say, still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste. He responded and said to his high officials, was it not three men? that we cast bound into the midst of the fire? Verse 25, he answered and said, look, I see four men loosed, walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth looks like it just might be the son of God. So we used to hear people say, oh, God took the heat out of the fire. No, 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 because they had so much that was binding them. It says when they went down, they were still tied up. But when Nebuchadnezzar looked in, they were loose. They were free, and they were walking around unbound. And so I don't think that God took the heat out of the fire because they needed the heat. They needed the fireplace to burn off everything that had them bound. But what I think happened is that my God knows how to aim the flame. And I have a God that has fire in your life, but he knows how to aim the flame. You got fiery situations in your life, but he knows that how to aim the flame at that line that you need burnt off of you. He knows how to aim the flame at those adulterous thoughts that you need burned off of you. He knows how to aim the flame at that haughtiness, at that arrogance, at that lack of integrity. He knows how to aim the flame and burn off the things that have you bound. But so many of us, we get impatient. We want to be delivered before we get to the fire. But we need the fireplace. We need the heat. Then once we're in the fire, we want to get delivered from the fire. But we serve a God that doesn't deliver you before the fire. He doesn't deliver you out of the fire. 
but he can deliver you in the fire because even though they were still in the fire they were free in the fire and some of you are in fiery situations but God has not taken you away from it because he's gotten in there with you and he'll have you free in the fire so you don't have to be alone you don't have to feel like you're by yourself in the fire because you got the God that created the fire and I don't know if you know it but humans are the only ones that have the doctrine of free will that fire has to obey what its creator is saying it has to do and so the fire is not out of control the fire can't do what it wants to do in your life because my God is so in control he is the Christos curious the superintendent of the world he controls everything by the palm of his hand he has so much power that there's nothing that he cannot do and so if he are in the fire and he's in the fire with you he's gonna aim the flame and make sure that it helps you and does not hinder you it helps you and it does not harm you is there anybody excited about about the fact that God has perfect attendance. There are some of you that need to realize he's everywhere at the same time. He has perfect attendance. If you're looking at your finances, he says present. If you look at your relationship, he says present. If you look at your ministry, he says present. If you're looking at your marriage, he says present. If you're looking at your parenting, he says present. He has perfect attendance, but some of you have been trying to give my God a tardy like Mary and Martha. If you would have been here, then my, my brother the one that died. Don't be trying to give my God a tardy because he's not working on your timetable. My God has perfect attendance. Number six, we see God performed a deliverance that was impressive. Nebuchadnezzar, this same man who faith had just dropped, he then looked at them and he became impressed by the delivering power of Jesus, of my God, and of the foreshadowing of Jesus. Verse 27, it says, the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair on their heads singed, nor were their trousers damaged. And the smell of fire had not even come on them. Who wouldn't serve a God like that? We serve such a God that he is a restorer. And the word restore means to bring back to its original state. And so these men walked out of the fire not even smelling like what they had come out of. And who in here knows that you don't look like what you've come through? You don't look like what you've been through. You don't look like what you've survived somebody needs to get excited about the restoration power of Jesus Christ of my God we can look at your forehead and see she's had five abortions she's been married eight times we can look at you and tell what you've been through you need to get excited about the restoration power of Jesus Christ you need to be excited that you get to volunteer your testimony and it's not written all over your body somebody needs to be excited that God is such a restorer that you don't look like what you've been through you don't smell like the smoke even though you've been living in a fiery situation is there anybody excited about the restoration power of my God number seven we see this proved to be a development that was impacting because Nebuchadnezzar then makes a new decree he now says Verse 29, therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb by limb. Their houses shall be reduced to rubbish. And in as much this God who is able to deliver them in this way, the king, the, the king called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. So you see, this was not a place of punishment. They needed this fireplace because it was a place of promotion. This, this was not a place that was a problem, but this was a place of purification. We see that this fire was not a place of ruin, but it was a place for refining. And who in here is in the middle of a fire? Maybe you're in the midst of a financial fire. Maybe you're in the midst of a family fire. Maybe you've been in the midst of a fire of just being fake, faulty, fictitious. You just 
don't know how to be the real you because you don't even know who the real you is anymore. You're so used to being fake. You're so used to living in a mask that you've forgotten what your face looks like. Is there anybody here that you know you've been living in a fire? You've been living through the fire of a church fight. You've been living through the fire of a shaky, shady marriage. You've been living through a fire of a ministry that's unstable. You've been living through a fire of motherhood. You just don't know what to do anymore. If you know you've been living through a fire, then you need to get excited because my God is in there with you. And not only should you get excited about what my God can do, but somebody just needs to get excited about what my God cannot do. He cannot lie. It is impossible for him to lie. Hebrews 6, 18 says that he can't lie. He's a man that would not lie if he could, and he could not lie if he would. Somebody needs to be excited about what God cannot do. He cannot fail. In Genesis 18, 14, he says, is there anything too hard for God? Somebody needs to get excited about what God cannot do. God cannot die. Jeremiah 10, 10 says that he is the only living God. And I don't know about you, but the Latter-day Saint movement thought that God was in Joseph Smith, but he died June 27th, 1844. The black Muslims thought that Elijah Muhammad was God, but he died February 25th, 1975 in February in um, Chicago, Illinois. The Branch Davidian religious sect thought that David Koresh was God, but he died April 19th, 1993. And the Jehovah's Witness thought that Charles Taz Russell was their God, but he died on October 31st, 1916. We serve the only living God. So somebody needs to act alive in here if you know you serve a God who's alive in the fire. He's able to keep you alive in the fire. Is there anybody glad that we serve the only living God? He cannot change. He cannot lie. He cannot sin. He cannot stop being God. He cannot lie and he cannot die. Somebody needs to give God praise if you know you need your fireplace. You know that there's a place in your life that's been fiery, but you need it to burn off everything that's been holding you back. You need it to burn off everything that's been keeping you still. You need it to burn off everything that's been holding you hostage, putting your praise on pause. You need it to burn off everything that's not like God in your life.